Good morning, everyone. So great to see you here. I hope everyone has power back and is safe and secure and warm when they're at home. And hearts go out to everyone who has struggled over these last few days. So glad that we have power and we've been able to gather and we're here for Sunday morning. It is such a true blessing to see you all here. One brief announcement from me is today is a communion Sunday and we are going to switch up how we're doing communion. Um, we have been doing people remaining in their seats and us bringing the plates and the trays to you. Today, when we're doing communion, we will invite you forward um, to receive a blessing and receive the elements. And then we'll invite you back to your seats after you've gotten your bread and gotten your cup so we can all take it and partake together. So it's not quite intinction, which was taking the bread and dipping it into the cup because there's still some... COVID concerns around that and health concerns about dipping our fingers in the same cup as everybody. But we're hoping for a little bit more personal connection and a way to really give you the blessing directly. Um, so hope, hope this works. We're trying it out and um, it'll be beautiful, beautiful way to celebrate communion together. Do we have other announcements today? A couple of announcements. There will be a deacons meeting after church. And for those of you who ha didn't have the privilege of looking at the rummage sale yesterday, guess what? It's still here. So, so please take a look after church and look around, see if there's anything you want. Um, most a lot of the items, if they're not priced, are called make me an offer. So um, we'll take about anything. The second part of that is um, we are looking for people who can possibly help us start to pack things up and then possibly take a box or two down to Goodwill or Salvation Army or another place who they could use the items. So those, those things will be happening after worship this morning. Um, after church, the... Uh, Street ministry people will be building uh, lunches, and any help that you can give will be uh, very much appreciated. And Tuesday Gals goes on. <laughs> on Tuesday. Bring a sandwich or whatever, and we'll be there anytime after 10. And we may be still packing boxes up. Who knows? I'm going to, I'm not just checking my phone, I'm opening up so I can see if there's anyone online who has a message for us. So bear in mind, I'm not just here going, like, okay, any other announcements? I'm gonna, what's Facebook telling me today? <laughs> right? It's bad when I get distracted during the sermon and start playing games on my phone. <laughs> All right, well, good morning. If there are no other announcements, let us move into our worship together. Beloved God, we invite your presence to our minds. We know you are here with us. We know your love surrounds us. Remind us of that love. Let us feel it truly and deeply in our bones. Today, we still celebrate the resurrection. We still celebrate the blessing that you are with us always. Help us to feel it and help us to bring that spirit alive. Amen. 
please join me for our call to worship. Let us be filled with wonder. Christ, Christ is, is with us. The age of mercy is upon us. Christ, Christ is, is with us. Rejoice in the good news. Christ, Christ is with us. Let us give, Let us give praise, praise and, and worship together. together. the words of praise in our ears, let us move to a centering prayer to connect to the divine mystery, the divine love, the blessings and grace of God and Jesus that are always with us, that surround us, that move in us, that are closer than our dearest and nearest breath. May we be filled and focus on God's love. Amen. Let us take that sense of feeling of peace and share it with one another and share it to our neighbors. Let's start by turning to the camera in the back and wishing a good peace to you, my friends. And to our choir, peace, my friends. And to everyone, be it here, online, anywhere, peace to you. Amen. And we have a message online from Pam Green, my mother. Hello from Nolan and Pam. So good, Nolan's got the attendance check mark, what we need to see. <laughs> and please rise in body or in spirit for our opening song, hymn 225, I Know My Redeemer Liveth.
As we prepare and prepare for our gospel and scripture readings today, we ask that God be with us to guide us and to open our minds and open our hearts to bring ancient scripture and ancient wisdom to our life today to see how it connects to the ongoing faith journey from now on always. Amen. Our first reading is from the epistle of First John, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. That which from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. And we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are waiting these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him no darkness at all. If we see we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from us all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the proportion for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Our gospel reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. We enter now with the words of scripture in our hearts, a time of silent prayer and confession, where we can open truly 
our hearts and our minds to the presence of God, the loving, gentle hold of Jesus. And know that they already know every aspect, every facet of our lives, all of our deeds, all of our thoughts. And know, too, that they have, and God has such deep compassion for us, such love for us. As we are open, we are met with forgiveness and understanding. We are met with courage to face the world anew. We are met with so much love. Let's open our hearts to God. Beloved God, we give such thanks for your mercy, for your love, for your understanding. Thank you. We know there is nowhere that we can go, no path we can follow, that you will not find us, hold us, and return us to you. Your love is with us always. We ask for forgiveness and know that it is there. We know. The love of Christ is filled and overflows and fills us too. God, please give us the courage to face the world, to make the amends that we need to, to offer grace for ourselves, offer grace to each other, and know that that, your love, is always there. Amen.
Thank you. Coming to our discipleship for all ages, where we invite the young, the young at heart, the curious to come forward and spend a little bit of time together. This definition of, as I always say, young and young at heart can include anyone. And if you stay in your seats, you're also welcome to hop in on the conversation. Our gospel reading today is set just right after the resurrection, when most of the disciples have not yet seen Jesus. Jesus has been taken away from them. Jesus had died. But has been, has come back. And Jesus goes to the disciples, and most of them see him. And they celebrate, and they're filled with joy, and they can't wait to tell their friend Thomas, good news, Jesus is back. And their friend Thomas goes, what? (laughs) What do you mean? That doesn't happen. I won't believe it. And they try to convince him. They're like, Thomas, we promised we saw you. He showed up. He said, peace be with you. You know how he always says, peace be with you. It's him. (laughs) And Thomas like, I won't believe it until I see it. Until I see him. And a few days later, they're all at dinner together, and Jesus appears to them again, and you can almost imagine all the disciples are just like, I told you so. (laughs) You didn't believe us, but here he is. It's amazing. It's amazing, and poor Thomas, people have ridiculed him till even today, always calling him Doubting Thomas, making kind of fun of him, like, how could he not have believed? Well, I mean, that's a pretty big claim right there. I'm going to just say I understand how Thomas might not have believed. But it comes to one important message, one thing Jesus also always preached and taught and said, with peace be with you, was also trust. Trust in me, trust in each other. And that's one of the things Thomas was being asked to do when You're with people and you love people. Sometimes they tell you news that's hard to understand. Sometimes they tell you things you can't quite believe. But you can ask, trust us. Trust. And sometimes we might need a little bit more proof, but one of the great miracles is that we can trust. So as we go here together, let's always hope that we can trust one another in this room. That when people tell you, you can believe and you can trust. And let's also ask ourselves to always be worthy of trust to make sure that we tell people true things. And if we tell something that's a little hard to believe, to make sure it's honest so that way people can trust in us and trust in one another. And above all, may we always be able to trust in God. Amen. Now you can go out and... <laughs> yeah. Wow, so quick. <laughs> Poor Thomas. <laughs> Doubting Thomas, that's just all, all he's known for. But it's definitely a perplexing and hard-to-believe story. Jesus has died. Jesus has reappeared, has come back to life, and has visited again. If I was Thomas, I think I would have maybe doubted too. And I also feel bad for him because in the last few days, the disciple Peter, after Jesus was arrested, denied Jesus publicly three times. One of the disciples, Judas, betrayed Jesus and sold him out to the authorities, and yet it's doubting Thomas that we still remember today as, <laughs> don't be like him. And it's like, well, out of the three disciples I can name off the top of my head, he doesn't seem so bad. <laughs> it's a perplexing mystery, the resurrection. And looking at this story, one of the most perplexing elements 
Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus has appeared to his disciples. And I'm amazed that what the proof Thomas needed was to see the wounds on Jesus, to see the scars, to see, well, actually the open wounds, not even yet scarred over from the crucifixion, the pierce in Jesus' side, the holes in Jesus' hands. And what's so perplexing to me was I would imagine if I were to sit and ask Jesus a question when he appeared, Jesus who was known as a great healer, Jesus who could restore sight to the blind, who could get paralytics to walk again, who could remove the blemishes from those with leprosies, is why on earth did you raise from the dead with wounds, still open wounds? It's a huge question. And in those who wonder that question, the ancient world was also incredibly perplexed by it. I could imagine it was hard to spread the good news of the gospel of telling the story of Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, was crucified, and then came back wounded. And in fact, when Jesus would tell people that he was about to have to suffer when he was alive, it was always accompanied by either the heavens roaring out that this is my son, the beloved, or Jesus would be transformed into this glowing aura around him, and beautiful white robes, majestic, truly majestic to behold. But when the resurrection happens, Jesus has these wounds on him still. In the ancient world, those who heard the good news that Jesus was alive again were not just perplexed. I'm sure they were looking. They were like, so tell me the story of your God. Rode into a town on a donkey, was killed, and then came back wounded? Nah. That doesn't sound great to me. I mean, the ancient world was used to gods and demigods and children of gods being incredibly powerful and strong, great warriors, great kings, great rulers, super strong, super tough, super amazing. And this story of, so you want us to worship a murdered peasant must have been a hard sell. In fact, the earliest representations of Jesus crucified which we see crosses now everywhere in churches, some with Jesus on the cross, some without. The earliest artistic displays were there to make fun of Christians. The very oldest one that scholars can find was in a Roman classroom with graffiti on the wall, and the graffiti was a man with a donkey's head on a cross with a person bowed down in prayer with graffiti under it that says, the Christians worshiping their God. They thought it was ridiculous. What could this God be? Wounded. Didn't conquer the world. You say they killed your God, but in the ancient world, if someone would have hurt the son of a God, a child of a God, cities would have been leveled and destroyed. There would have been great vengeance. But instead, Jesus came back meek, wounded, and preaching forgiveness. The ancient world just was staring at them, baffled that people called this the good news made graffiti to ridicule. It's amazing to me that this was how Jesus came back. This was Jesus challenging and upending the entire world, the entire idea of what could be sacred. Sacred was no longer this physical ideal of massive strength and power. Being sacred was no longer great rulers, great kings, great kingdoms and empires. Being sacred was this humble, loving person preaching peace, preaching healing, preaching compassion, wounded, showing the sacredness of all life, even life that is struggling. So when Jesus came back this way, changed everything about what it was to believe, changed everything about what was sacred in life. Truly, truly astounding. And now the, the disciples, I'm sure, had to wrestle with this one and maybe would have asked, as I would have asked, well, tell me about the healing narratives. You were there alive healing people. You 
you changed, you would find people who could not see, you'd give them sight, you would find people who could not walk, you would lift them up and they could walk again. What happened with that? Why couldn't you do this for you? It would be a big question on my mind. I'm also a person I live, though you cannot always tell it, with a disability. I have this disorder where sometimes my body dumps all of its potassium and I can't move my arms or my legs. Sometimes I have great pain. And I've definitely wrestled with also those healing narratives of kind of, well, has anyone ever sat there and prayed and wished, oh God, why don't you heal me? Oh God, why don't you restore me to physical health? I know I've prayed that. I know I've sat there and been kind of jealous, a little filled with envy, some of those um, other crimes in the, the Ten Commandments of going, why them and not me? Who's wrestled and gone, I wish, oh, wish that I had a different body than the body that I have right now. So we've seen those healing narratives, and it's Jesus. You could heal anyone. Wish you could heal me, but why didn't you heal yourself? And there's an important talking about how the sacredness of the world used to be and what Jesus upended in his resurrection. Biblical scholars look at the healing narratives and say what was most important about those healing narratives was those who were sick, those who couldn't see, those who couldn't walk, were seen as ritually impure. They were not able to partake of life in the temples and the worship because the gods only want to see the healthy was kind of the the gist of it or one of the healing narratives where jesus returned sight people were asking jesus well who sinned when they saw this person was it did this person sin is that why they can't see did their parents sin and this is the punishment and jesus said no 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 one had to have sinned for this person to have not have sight this person is beloved by god and sight was restored and each time jesus healed somebody they were able to return to ritual life or able to return to the temple be able to return to prayer with one another that was before jesus's resurrection after jesus's resurrection after christ has returned in the whole spiritual world where Jesus stopped talking about the temple as a physical place and began talking about the temple as the body and as the world. And how confusing it must have been for those wounds to have been there. Jesus was, I believe, telling us every single body is sacred. Every single person is filled with the right to worship, the right to gather, the right to be loved. The very model and ideal of God, of the ideal of being a human, is this meek, mild, wounded Jesus. You are able to return to worship. You should never have been cast out of being able to worship. Jesus said, no matter if you are sick, if you're hurt, your body is still sacred. You are still sacred. How often... Do we pray for healing to come? More than that, how often, truly, if we have, say we have a sickness, we have an illness, we have a disability, say our bodies are just getting older and slower than they used to be, say we're walking with more assisted devices than we had before, how much anguish can come from just wishing that it were different instead of living with what? and who we are. How much pain can come from just saying, oh, darn it. (laughs) Oh, darn it, I wish. Wish that it were just different. And I believe Jesus appearing this way is first saying, you don't have to wish to be different. You are loved. Your body is loved. You are whole. You are sacred. Start with that element. We don't need to be changed to be loved. Now, we don't need, we can let that anguish go of wishing that we were something that we were not, because bodies are bodies. Sometimes they hurt, sometimes they don't. 
And I'm not saying at all that we should not try if we're feeling sick to take medication or if we're in pain to not try to treat our payment and, and manage our pain. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, take care of ourselves. But we can and we are invited. I believe one of the things that Jesus showing off in this way is saying being disabled is just being part of life. It's fine. Everyone's body is different. But every body, every single body is loved and whole and sacred. In disability studies, there are sort of two models of looking at disability. One model is the medical model that if someone is disabled or sick, that it is a solely a medical condition to be solved. as a problem with the individual and that problem needs to be changed. Another model is the social model of disability, where so much disability is not in the individual, but it's in society. Take someone in a wheelchair approaching an elevated platform like our own, not to call us out for a second, but I will. A person who wants to get on this microphone in a wheelchair is much more disabled by the fact that we have stairs than if we had a ramp here. Because if we had a ramp and a wheelchair, there would be no impairment impediment at all just scoot right on up but the way that the world is set up makes hardships for people with different body types and this resurrection of jesus would tell us to look and say how can we make the world if we hold that each person in each body type is sacred how can we make the world in such a way that honors every body every person the spiritual world before Jesus was a spiritual world of that medical model. Something is wrong with your body. Maybe you sinned, but it's a blemish and we don't want to welcome it. Jesus' resurrection opened up everything and said, nope, everyone is sacred. We are all sacred. So we are going to do everything we can to restore community. His first healing narratives were just that restoring community no longer saying oh that person is stuck on a mat let's let them leave them be let's heal them let's do whatever we can to return them to community not having to change the individual but we got to work together here so when jesus comes back and shows his wounds to his disciples he's showing in some ways much larger than just coming back from the dead Jesus is saying, one and all, I am with you. When you are hurt, I have felt your pain. When you are sick, you can see yourself in me. You don't have to be the most powerful, strong person in the world. You, your heart, your essence is sacred. And your form, your body around your essence is sacred Regardless, every single person is sacred. And I can understand why people would want to ridicule that because it is a challenge to the entire worldview. The entire everything. Is each person sacred? Do you have to be an emperor to be sacred or do you just have to be? Do you have to be the most powerful athlete in the world to be sacred or do you just have to be? The risen Jesus, the wounded Jesus, the disabled Jesus is my God. Is my God 100%. I remember the first time just being a person with a disability where sometimes I limp really badly and I saw a play and the main character had cerebral palsy and was built into the character and just the way they walked and limped reminded me of the ways sometimes I walk and limp. And to see that person on stage to be celebrated was so freeing in my heart. I was like, I see you. I see me in you. And it opened up everything. It was beautiful. I cried. It was a funny play, good play too. But that moment of that, I see you. Jesus coming not in radiant glory, not 
perfectly chiseled in the resurrection, not in the beautiful robe surrounded by this aura, but Jesus coming as a person gives us all the ability to look and say, I have wounds, I have scars, I'm not always at my best, and I see me in you. I see me in Christ, and this is the Christ that walks with us and loves us. This is the Christ of infinite power. We may say disabled, but to spread the loving message for every person in the world to look up and say, I see me in you, that is the most enabling, most empowering, most beautiful statement I think Jesus could make. So no wonder the disciples doubted a little bit. They were just given a whole new upending spiritual moment. What? (laughs) And we are asked to believe. Asked to believe not just that Christ is alive and with us, asked to believe that when we are suffering or when we are in pain, it is not because we sinned or not because our ancestors sinned. We are asked to believe that the love of God is with us now and always. Amen. Now, please rise in body or in spirit. For him, 409, I hunger and I thirst. Please raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you. Thank you everyone who helped out towards yesterday's event, who brought things, who set up, who came and bought, um, and who will help us downsize. Thank you so much. Well, I have several joys and prayers. Um, 
first prayers. Um, you all know what I do during the week. Um, we're facing a couple of weeks where we're wrapping our work up in Augusta and really tough stuff um, around gun violence and other issues. So I ask for your prayers. Um, my joys, um, I am going to be honored and humbled that Reverend Zeb and David are going to come up to the legislature. David will sing gloriously, as he does, and um, Zeb will do the prayer. So, um, and I plan on introducing them to all my, my pals. So. Um, and lastly, um, a prayer for Hunter. He's home. Still finding his way. can't go a day without praying for what's going on in Israel right now. And I pray that our government stops sending the ammunition to Israel. They're not just sending firearms and stuff. They're sending 500-pound bombs. Has anybody here seen what a 500-pound bomb will do? It's designed to take out buildings and take out cities. And also, we're sending a few thousand-pound bombs. We don't need that. They don't need that for that. It's for one reason. And it's not just to take out Hamas. And we've got to get this stuff stopped. And I pray that we do, we get some messages to the White House, throw the bums out that are there, because this is, we're losing respect with this country, with the world and everything else, and it's not right. It's not right for the future, our younger generation, but it's got to stop, and I, we just got to pray again that something is done and happens pretty soon, especially what happened after this last week. So I pray for that. Lovely God, provided no one is about to raise their hand and I'm cutting anyone off. Okay. <laughs> the loving God, we ask that you hold all of these prayers. We ask that you give guidance, give nurturing, give comfort to all. We ask for peace. We ask that the world all of our conflicts and all of our strives may one day be resolved. Beloved God, we trust in you. We know you hear our joys. We know you hear our sorrows. We know you are with not just us in this room, but you are with every single person. Please grant them strength. Grant us all strength and mercy. Amen. Please join me for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're coming to our time of shared offerings and blessings. If you have a gift that you are able to give to the congregation, be it your presence, your prayers, your compassion, and your financial contributions, please know that we gratefully receive all that you can and do offer. Today is also a first Sunday where we lift up our deacon's fund, which is uh, the white envelopes in your bulletin. This is the fund that helps us provide food and support for anyone who reaches out to the church. So it is our way of living into our message of the gospel to care for one another. Your offering will now be gratefully taken and received.
join me for the prayer of dedication. Beloved God, we give thanks for these gifts today. We give thanks for all our blessings. We dedicate this offering to you and your service. We promise to spread your love and peace far and wide. Amen. Beloved God, as we approach this communion table, we ask that your spirit be with us to remind us that you are truly with us. And as we partake of this meal, may we be filled with your sense of wholeness, fullness, and reminded that with each other, with the love and presence of God, we are whole always. Amen. This Sunday, as I said, we are doing communion a little different. As we invite you to the table, we are going to physically invite you to the table. Um, if you can come forward, please do. If you would like to take communion in your seat, a deacon can bring you the elements. This table is God's table, welcome and open to all, truly. No matter who you are, where you are in your life, you are welcome to partake of the love and blessing of God. Thank you. On the day that Jesus was given up, he took this bread and said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Whenever you break of this bread, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and the wine, and said, This cup is my blood, the cup of new covenant, spilled out for the forgiveness of many, poured out for all. Poured out for all. Whenever you take this bread and this cup, do this in remembrance of me. As we remember Christ in our life, we invite you to come forward, deacons, if you can help me. Come forward for the communion, take the elements, get the bread, the body, the cup, and return to your seats so we can all eat together. Amen.
the bread of life. In the cup of covenant. Thanks be to God. Please join me for a prayer of thanksgiving. Beloved God, gathered at your table, we give our deepest thanks. We remember the miracle of resurrection. Even death, sin, and tragedy cannot separate us from you. We give our deepest thanks that you are with us now and forever. Thank you for serving this meal in Holy Communion. May we be inspired to serve others as you have served us. Amen. Now please rise in body and spirit for our closing hymn, 514, God Who Touches the Earth with Beauty. this place today. Remind us always that we are whole and beloved and to treat others as they are whole and beloved. God and Christ walk with us always and for that we give our deepest greatest thanks. Amen.